It's Monday, October 3rd. From inside the WTOP newsroom, this is the DMV Download, brought to you by the men and women of Steamfitters Local 602. Get an estimate and learn more at steamfitters-602.org. Today, the most high-profile person to go on trial in connection with the insurrection on January 6th, Oath Keepers founder Stuart Rhodes and four of his associates went before a judge and jury. The Department of Justice charged Rhodes and his deputies with seditious conspiracy, alleging he planned for weeks and acquired weapons to take control of the U.S. Capitol to prevent President Biden's confirmation. CBS News congressional correspondent Scott McFarlane was in the room where it happened and brings us there. They're just such profound allegations. If you take a step back to reflect upon them, they're to take your breath away, Mm -hmm. alleging that this group tried to block the peaceful transfer of power in America. And Megan is back in the DMV Download Studios. Why was she gone for a few days last week? We'll tell you why. Thanks for joining us. I'm Megan Cloherty. And I'm Luke Garrett. In one of the most highly anticipated trials in the wake of the January 6th insurrection, federal prosecutors began their opening statements, arguing that Stuart Rhodes, the leader of the Oath Keepers, and his associates planned a, quote, armed rebellion against the U.S. government. They said Rhodes's goal was to stop the peaceful transfer of presidential power. CBS News congressional correspondent Scott McFarlane has been covering the trials of every insurrectionist and continues to work on this one. He was in the D.C. District Courtroom this morning and joins us now. Scott, thank you for being here. Of course. So we can probably count the number of sedition conspiracy cases brought in front of a jury on two hands, maybe. It's a very rare charge. We heard opening statements today and at the end of the Justice Department, Jeffrey Nessler's opening statement He lays out his case against the Oath Keepers. You tweeted that that opening statement was unlike any given before. Why did you say that? Well, first of all, the seditious conspiracy charge is beyond rare. It's almost unheard of in Mm. American history. So a prosecutor explaining to a jury what that means is a rare moment. I'm not sure the jurors appreciate how rare this is, but it is rare. Also, I mean, this was a modern day attempt to overthrow the government, according to prosecutors, an armed group staging guns outside the city limits, you know, allegations of possible boats to bring them into the city from Virginia, allegations that the group raised tens of thousands of dollars to equip this Insurrection Act force. Mm. Here's the thing. All of this is uncharted waters. Mm. That's both a burden and a responsibility for the prosecution. And they had to start making that case today. Right. And Scott, you've been following a lot of these cases in the wake of January 6th. Did this one stand out and why? Uniquely. I'm glad you asked. The the, uh, opening argument was a 90 minute um, forceful, crisp laying out of facts by the prosecution. Department of Justice prosecutor Jeffrey Nessler, without notes, was just ratcheting his way through Mm. this series of allegations. And they're just such profound allegations. If you take a step back to reflect upon them, they take your breath away, Mm. alleging that this group tried to block the peaceful transfer of power in America, that they knew they wanted to do this, that they were targeting in particular Speaker Pelosi, that they were targeting the Capitol for attack. That's a contrast even from other January 6th defendants who are accused of unlawfully picketing, parading, getting caught up with the crowd, entering and quickly exiting, having no damage, no efforts to assault, no plan ahead of time and no leadership role. This is something quite different. This is a different stratosphere we've entered. Mm. Scott, it took a little while to get us here, in part because uh, the defense attorney for Mr. Rhodes, Philip Linder, has argued this isn't the right place to have this trial. Um, Can you talk about some of those motions and what he was arguing for this to be dismissed. First of all, they join a growing list of January 6th defendants who have been trying to get their trials moved at Washington, D.C., arguing this is not the best venue for this trial because they've argued that the jury here can't be unbiased, that people who live in the District of Columbia you know, are too viscerally connected to January 6th, live in close proximity to Capitol Hill, right. or are biased because of what the defense lawyers call inflammatory media coverage. The judges, one after another after another, have knocked out those requests and ordered the trials to remain in Washington, D.C., and said jury selection is enough to secure an unbiased jury. That's what happened here. But it happened here over and over and over again. This group kept asking to get their case moved, including at the 11th hour. Just didn't work. Mm. So the trial proceeds with a District of Columbia jury. And that jury sat down, you know, this morning. What did the prosecutors with the Defense Department really say to them? What were their key arguments in their opening statement? That this was a plan 
that this was not an organic thing. They're arguing that a conspiracy involves multiple people playing multiple roles. But they also leaned into this argument, which I, I wasn't surprised by, but also wasn't expecting, that a conspiracy needn't write down and codify everybody's role and plot to be a conspiracy, mm. that there can be some unspoken roles or things that aren't formally noted, mm. but that people know they have to do anyhow. And I think that's likely indicating, it's likely forecasting some of the arguments they're going to make, that there was an understanding or an unwritten set of responsibilities for this group. Um, we spoke a little bit about this at the top, but um, this charge specifically is difficult to prove. Do you know why that is? It's so rarely done. I mean, there aren't a lot of line prosecutors at the U.S. Justice Department with a deep <laughs> portfolio of seditious conspiracy prosecutions. Mm. Um, but I- I'll note the, the counter argument, which is a lot of these cases from January 6th are unprecedented for prosecutors. They haven't done something like this before. Right. And you both know the batting average right now for the Justice Department in front of a D.C. jury in January 6th cases, batting 1,000. They mm. haven't had one acquittal on any one charge. So the success rate is high as they enter this, the highest level of trial. And so moving now to Rhodes' defense attorney, Philip Linder, what arguments did he make to the D.C. jury? Philip Linder, who is um, still Stuart Rhodes' defense lawyer, even though Stuart Rhodes tried to dismiss him at the last minute, mm. um, was more forecasting an argument than making an argument mm. that he's we're going to show you that there are weaknesses in what the Justice Department will present. We're going to show you the other side of this story without you know, really specifying what that other side is or what the other argument is. But he did indicate what the prosecutors indicate, that they're going to make some argument about the Insurrection Act, that they were preparing for the prospect of Donald Trump invoking the Insurrection Act, and that were, they were readying themselves, equipping themselves for that contingency. Therefore, the defense would argue, justifying what they did January 6th. The prosecutors know they're going there and mm. already try to whittle that down. I also expect there to be some defense from these defense attorneys based on their pretrial filings that will argue this group was here on a security mission to provide security for VIPs. The prosecutors also forecast that contingency by arguing in their opening arguments that this group was not licensed or paid or trained to provide security in the District of Columbia that day. And just to take a pause here, can we talk a little bit about the Insurrection Act? I mean, what even is that? So this is where I'd love to call up my wife, who's a history teacher. because She was <laughs> schooling me on this ahead of trial. It, 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 it really is uh, an ancient, um, I think it's an 1807 wow. law that empowers the president to I guess, federalize the guard mm. or send out the U.S. military when circumstances require it for civil disorder. Uh, for rebellion. I mean, this is centuries old and obviously not something that's been actualized or (laughs) mobilized in modern American history. But (laughs) what the the prosecutors are going to say is you can you can claim you are here on behalf of the Insurrection Act or preparing for the possibility of the Insurrection Act. Donald Trump didn't invoke it. Right. Um, Which would therefore not excuse anything. You allegedly did that day. Mm. Um, Scott, what do we know about Stuart Rhodes? I know he's the most high profile person who's in this group on trial together. But what is his background? Interesting you ask that because the prosecutors gave more of a biography of Stuart Rhodes during opening arguments today than they did for the other four Mm co-defendants, making clear that Stuart Rhodes is a leader, not only a man who wears the the prosecutors say his trademark cowboy hat and man who wears an eye patch, but they say he's a, a Harvard law grad a former congressional staffer, somebody who's well-versed in federal law and knew the circumstances quite well of January 6th, knew that it was a pivotal day, or at least believed it was a pivotal day. He came to January 6th with exceptional knowledge of the law, according to prosecutors. That seems to be some part of the trajectory of where their case is going. Mm. That Stuart Rhodes, they say, led the conspiracy, founded the Oath Keepers, and was driving some of this plan. For some of us who might forget, you know, between all these groups with January 6th, who are the Oath Keepers? They're a far right group, according to not only the Department of Justice, but those who closely monitor these types of organizations. Um, They are, I think some would argue, paramilitary. So they have um, any number of military veterans, people with military skills among their members. They have deployed themselves um, to Ferguson during unrest there. Mm. They had... Any, any number of presences here in our community before January 6th, during the time between Election Day 
and January 6th when there were so many mm. uh, fraught moments here in the District of Columbia. Um, this particular group is a snapshot of them. These are five of the accused Oath Keepers. There are many others, but these five are the first ones to go on trial as a chunk. Um, there's one from Ohio. There's one from Florida. Stuart Rhodes is from Texas. And then there's Thomas Caldwell, who is from Berryville. He's from Clark County, Virginia. And he, according to prosecutors today, was the one who was organizing what they call the QRF, the Quick Reaction Force, the staging of guns in Ballston outside the city limits. Caldwell is the only one of these five, by the way, who's on pretrial release, not in jail right now. He's home in Virginia. Um, I mentioned him not just because he's local to the D.C. area, but to keep showing this image of him to the jury wearing a big Washington football team snowcap, which mm. just to this jury may not be it may, may be memorable. It may just communicate to the Washington, D.C. jury that among those who are sitting in front of you are not just out of the towners, but some at least one folk from the area. Right. Um, if convicted, these Oath Keepers could face up to 20 years in prison each. Scott, how long do we know this trial is supposed to take and kind of what's next after opening statements? What's next is for me to get a very comfortable chair because <laughs> it's going to go a very long time. The trial could last six to seven weeks by orders of magnitude. That is just so much longer than the other January 6th trials, most of which have wrapped in one week or less. The stakes are higher. The charge is a higher level. There are five co-defendants. We expect any number of witnesses for both sides, including other accused members of the conspiracy mm -hmm. who've pleaded guilty and agreed to cooperate and turn over themselves as witnesses. Oh, wow. And we learned, we expect to hear from Stuart Rhodes in his own defense. That'll be something um, as he takes the stand, makes his own argument. That's interesting because uh, traditionally, I mean, most defense attorneys will tell them, tell their clients, do not take the stand in your own defense. So it's interesting. To, well, maybe we'll learn why he wanted to. And maybe... There's an 11th hour change of heart there. Yeah. Mm. But Stuart Rhodes is a former attorney. Um, he graduated law school. He probably has his own thoughts about what should be said on the stand. May right. want to do it himself. He right. may bring with this also this motivation to have his voice heard. I mean, he's got quite a platform here mm. at this trial. I mean, his legal jeopardy is high, but he also has the world's attention. Right. Right. He has a, a, a courtroom that is jammed, overflowing with media and I think he realizes that. Mm. As we wrap up here, did we learn anything more about, you know, former President Trump's involvement in January 6th? I know many were looking towards this trial to see if there's any information on, you know, further connections that, you know, were investigated by the January 6th committee. Did we learn anything more here? A few different threads. First of all, the defense attorney in his opening statement in the opening minutes made, <laughs> made it known to the jury that Stuart Rhodes offered to testify live in prime time or on t television in front of the January 6th committee and had his offer rebuffed. And the offer to, tele to, to testify live on TV was not one the committee was ever going to take seriously. Mm. So, um, But he did throw it out there and made it known to the jury. What else can come out of this hearing for, that has a January 6th nexus or has a Donald Trump nexus? We don't know, but with Stuart Rhodes indicating he'll testify, it could be an awful lot. Mm -hmm. It's sick. The January 6th Select Committee, I expect them to come up and be referenced, but really they were a fixture of the pretrial arguments where the defense lawyers were arguing all the attention the committee has stirred up, all the things the committee has said about the Oath Keepers just make it impossible to have a fair trial here in Washington. And even if unspoken, I think the indication from the judge was that the January 6th Committee was heard and seen everywhere in the country mm. no 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 more so in dc necessarily than elsewhere so it's not really good grounds to move your case well we'll see what happens over this trial and we know you'll be covering it scott mcfarland cbs congressional correspondent we thank you for your time thank you both and after the break do allergies have you down that makes one of us Backed by the experience of its hardworking members, Steamfitters Local 602 is ready to take on your next commercial heating, cooling, HVAC, or refrigeration project. Steamfitters Local 602 adds value to our community through its partnerships with local contractors and building owners, all while keeping the focus on improving the lives of its members and their families throughout the DMV. For work that's on time and on budget, go to steamfitters-602.org to schedule your next project. That's steamfitters-602.org. Steamfitters Local 602 changing lives. Thanks for listening to the DMV Download. If you like this show, give us five stars and leave us a review on Apple Podcast. We love hearing from you guys and your reviews really do help other listeners find this, our area's only in-depth daily local news podcast. 
And thank you for making us a part of your day. And before we go, you can hear my in my voice. I'm, I'm a little under the weather. A de- it's still a good voice, you know, a deep, so- <laughs> a deep Megan voice. It's deep and saucy. Um, no, I have allergies, and it's funny because there's so many people who are feeling crappy. Let's mm. just say that word. Totally. And it's because of allergies. So I looked it up. Apparently, ragweed is out of control. Ragweed, what are you doing? It's, out of control. It's ragweed, man. Because okay, so it's been rainy the last couple weeks, right? Grasses and weeds grow out of control, and mm. then it usually peaks around mid-September, but because we've had such wet weather, oh. and then really nice, good, warm weather after that, it's like prime time, baby. Off the charts. Yeah. And so apparently last week, um, ragweed was only at 25, like measuring it at 25, um, which, you know, you guys can look this up yourselves, but on September 15th, it was at 148. Sheesh. So it's like, you know, anyway, so I talked to a doctor and they were like, we are constantly hearing from people who think they have colds, mm. but it's actually allergies. So here's how you know the difference. Colds, you get a fever and body aches, and it, it goes away within a few days. Allergies, no fever, no body aches, and it never goes away. <laughs> it's like stuck with you forever. But the stuffy nose and itchy throat. Yeah, chenopods and sagebrush are really high right now. And hay fever, just fun fact, because we've always heard that, but I, what is that? It specifically affects the nose, apparently, neither triggered by hay nor causes a fever, mm. but it generally happens in the fall and it's in like, you know, reaction to allergies. So wow. There you go. Dang. Well, I'm sorry that the allergies are so rough. I feel, I know, I feel bad I'm, over here just, you know, coasting, I, coasting I know. through. <laughs> I know. As soon as we knew that Luke didn't get sick because I have been around him so much, we're like, oh, it has to be allergies. Indeed. Well, we're happy you're back because you Thank were you. out, you know, Thursday, Friday. Thanks for being a trooper. Dude, I'm, I'm, I'm here with you and I know I'm not the only one suffering, so, you know. Buy all the things that'll clear your nasal passages so you can sleep, people. Indeed. Indeed. And that'll do it for us today (laughs) on the DMV Download. Oh, we're sponsored by Steamfitters Local 602. Our managing editor is Craig Schwab, and our music is by Real World. Give us a review and rate our show if you get the chance. Tell your friends and family about the show as well. We love telling more stories to more people. And subscribe, too. And the DMV Download is a product of WTOP News. Listen on 103.5 FM in D.C., 107.7 FM in Virginia, 103.9 FM in Frederick, online at WTOP.com and on the WTOP News app. Have a good Monday night.